inducted into the University of Minnesota uh, Duluth Hall of Fame. He was a captain for the hockey team at UMD, played on two Olympic teams, captain of the 92 team, three world championships for Team USA, played in the NHL, AHL, IHL, the Swedish League, um, started the Concordia program, and has coached a whole host of Team USA's between 16U at the Five Nations and the Halinka for the 17s. Uh, and most recently, Guy had the opportunity to coach the Youth Olympic team uh, that went to Switzerland, and the team did fantastic. And I'm sure he'll give us a couple stories and tidbits on how that went tonight. Uh, and a, won a gold medal as a coach for the U.S. Paralympic team. So just a wonderful resource for us to have here in Minnesota. And Guy, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. You ready to rock and roll? All set. I'm gonna hit my share screen here. Got a bunch of friends on the call right now. That's pretty good. And they're sending me text messages as we speak, so. They probably like those jerseys behind you. Yeah, they're covering up the cinder block walls, friends. Um, okay, bear with me here. Um, sorry. Yeah, they're nice jerseys. I'm uh, actually one of them's a Paralympic jersey. Then I'm not a jersey collector, but uh, one's a Tichuk. He was one of my favorite players, and I played with Hall at UMD. So he scored the famous uh, kicking motion goal way back when. But uh, yeah, we, I appreciate you guys being on the call tonight and I appreciate you, uh, Jacob, asking me to be on the call, You're doing a fantastic job with these webinars, especially considering the circumstances that are going on right now. So um, I apologize for the lighting in my little office here, my nook and cranny in the basement, bear with me. Um, I'm not, here to tell you what to do as far as player development guys but uh you know I, I think i've probably been on 20 zooms this week and you know we average four to six a day uh we discuss player development with uh people from local associations to uh, the nhl to europe so i'm a good listener uh i've been in the game for a long time but uh, I'm still learning. And uh, the game has evolved a lot, especially in the past 10 years. So um, again, I'm not here to tell you what to do. My objective essentially is to get you thinking about player development. Um, it's not an exact science you need to figure out um, and help your player figure out what's best for them uh, and for your family. So, um, Q and A is important here. I've always felt uncomfortable about uh, telling people what to do. You know, when I was younger, to play on my high school team was my goal, and all this other stuff has been a bonus for me. So, I'm very fortunate to be involved in the game. So I'll stop rambling here, but please send in uh, questions. I know there's some passionate development people on this call. I've already seen a lot of names. Um, Appreciate your time. So let's rock and roll. Uh, I've got some things that I'm trying to get, you know, to trigger you guys to think about some some things that at 14 you that are important. And I'm just going to kind of rattle them off here. But uh, what we're looking for, okay, and things to work on at 14 you is refined skill sets. Um, and that's pretty vague. We're just going to hit the tip of the iceberg here, but um, skill sets meaning you need to be a very good skater. You need to have stick handling skills, passing skills, and shooting skills. You need to work on this stuff. Um, if you want to get better, you know, we when we start to see at 15, uh, we start telling the kids that they start taking control of their own destiny. And uh, we really like to see these skill sets in place. Um, however mature you are physically or mentally. So, you know, that's a, that's a key thing, but there's, there's so much more to it, but to uh, get those skill sets in place and to continue, 
continue to work on them until the day you're done playing the game is really crucial to to excelling in the game. So uh, moving on to you need to develop a routine. Um, I just actually got off the phone with a friend of mine uh, who coached in in uh, the American League and he's been developing players for Pittsburgh. Um, I had to cut him off short because I'm getting on this call, but he said, what are you going to talk about tonight? And uh, I went from, I got from refine your skill set down to routine. And then he went off of the routine deal. And, uh, you know, you can create a routine at the Bantam level at 13 years old, 14 years old, because you're going to have to have that routine if you want to develop and get better as an older player. And uh, he said, I got something for you. You got to tell these guys, you really need to embrace this uh, because your routine is going to get boring. You're going to have negative thoughts in your head when it's time to wake up in the morning and you don't feel like training. You have to fight through that with the positive stuff um, and, and really embrace that to get you actually mentally prepared and physically prepared to go out and get better out on the ice or whether you're training off ice, which is a big deal. Um, and again, it comes from within, especially starting at 15. You kind of make that transfer, transfer from mom and dad and the player to the player takes it on himself and the coach, if that makes sense to everybody. Um, you have to have balance in your week. That 168 is 168 hours that you have in a week. And uh, you need to balance that out from, you know, family, friends, school, um, you know, your, your, your training for your sport, um, recreational activities, you name it. And that balance is really important because if you get way too much of something, um, at some point you're going to, you're going to burn out a little bit. So, um, and, and guy, just expanding on that quickly, what would be a type of routine you would recommend for a band of age player? Well, you know what, Jacob, we're going to actually get into that. Uh, I've got a couple slides from, um, two countries that are really doing a great job in player development. Uh, one in Finland uh, or Finland and Sweden. I've got the uh, Finnish ice hockey kind of uh, ratios, and I've got the uh, I've got one from Schleftia, Sweden. That's a one of the best development clubs um, in the world right now. So uh, we'll we'll talk about that. But that's a great question. Um, so I'll roll through these a little bit. Um, next thing really is functional um, training. You know, back in the day, it was bench press the arena and do deep, heavy squats. So with 14 new kids, and let me state this, every athlete is an experiment in one. It's not an exact science. So you have to understand, you know, peak height vo uh, velocity. So when these kids are going through puberty and when it's time to put muscle mass on, et cetera. But the most important thing um, in general at, at 14 U is body weight exercises and mastering the range of motion and focusing on, on core strength. Um, and again, uh, not an exact science. Um, that field is currently, you know, ever evolving um, as far as dry land and off ice training. Um, so we're, we're kind of on top of that thing but it's a very opinionated field. Just want to make that clear. So moving on, um, we need to get our kids to value proper sleep, nutrition, hydration. All of these things have an effect on performance and development. Um, so, you know, if the kids are up late night playing their, their games, um, and we even have this problem at the higher levels with professional players, um, it's kind of a concern. Sleep, 
degradation is uh, is a big deal. It has an effect on your performance. And if you want to be the best you can be, you need to get the proper sleep. Um, nutrition also is key. It's good to start to get into those habits. A lot of our kids can eat anything at 14U and it won't have really have an effect on them. But uh, if you don't have good habits as you get older, um, it could have a, a, a really uh, negative effect on your, your performance. But hydration is key as well. Um, and I know I, I'm probably stating the obvious for a lot of people, but uh, it's not that hard. It, if you stick with stuff like this and you have a good routine and you take care of your body, um, it's key. But you know, if you come to national camp um, or wherever you're going to perform as a kid, uh, you need to take care of that engine. Your muscles need a certain amount, a certain percentage of hydration, um, and that's water, plain and simple water, and you need to be pounding that so you can perform uh, at the highest level. Uh, next one, become a student of the game, hockey IQ. Uh, you know, we talked to, like I say, we talked to guys from the local associations all the way through the NHL been on several calls this week and uh, people feel like that's one of our deficiencies in the U.S. Um, be a student of the game. Um, you know, I actually played with a, a gentleman that's been uh, involved with, with winning three Stanley Cups with Chicago. Um, we were partners at Duluth. Um, he came to school and I remember this. We had this conversation the other day he came to school with his Bobby Orr VHS tapes. And I didn't understand that back then, but I certainly do now because he was a very, he's the smartest hockey guy I know. Um, so by that, I mean, kids watch hockey, watch the next level, see what they're doing, get motivated with that. Um, you need to make quick decisions out on the ice uh we skill sets are one thing but if you want to get over that next hurdle you have to have high hockey iq um warm-up techniques hey, go ahead jacob we had a question come through the chat at this age group given today's kids and the fact that very few may watch a hockey game what's the best way to help them to become students of the game um you can you can utilize practice time as that and kids are smart put them into situations where there's constraints and they they'll figure it out um, block practices just going around cones um, you know that's that helps skill sets but it doesn't help in the decision making so you can kind of put any um, I guess <laughs> any kind of uh, anything into a small area game. Um, and you can kind of guide them to the outcome, but they have to make decisions on their own. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay, so, um, you know, I can do any kind of small area game and put a twist on, on it as a defensive game or an offensive game or body contact or puck possession, whatever you want to do. Um, but that's a good way to do it because I know that, you know, and, and again, everybody deserves a good experience in hockey. Everybody deserves to learn. Um, some kids are a little bit more hungry than the others, but uh, hockey for several, you know, for, for a good percentage of the kids essentially is a novelty. Okay. They don't want to put that extra time in and, th and that's okay. But you can add this stuff to your practices uh, and with a well-planned practice, you can certainly, you know, come to the, the, uh, the points that you want. And a lot of times that comes from interaction with the coach and feedback as well from the kids. What's their perception? Because they perceive things a lot differently than we do as coaches. And for those who are interested, we do have an upcoming webinar that I think you're leading guy 
all on uh, teaching concepts through small area games that I think would be great for everyone to listen into to expand on uh, on that topic and learn how to do that. Yes, I, I I just learned that two seconds ago that I'm leading that Jacob, but that's that's okay. <laughs> so, um, well, somebody's Lee. I forgot if it was you or somebody else. But no, it's okay. Have I have up. no idea. We've been everybody's been on four to six zooms a day. It's all good, but. Um, anyways, practice proper warm up techniques. Uh, back in the day, we used to static stretch, cold stretch. Not necessarily the best thing for you. Um, there's also ballistic stretching, uh, high energy explosive stretching. Uh, today, what we'd like our players to do is have a, a uh, dynamic st stretch before they get out on the ice. 10 to 15 minutes of movement with stretching involved. Um, so, you know, ice, ice costs are huge. We don't want to waste any time. We want to get the kids out on the, uh, ice and have them ready to rock and roll. Um, at Bantam, certainly know the four roles of hockey, um, you know, offense with the puck, offense away from the puck, defense on the puck, defense away from the puck, really simple stuff. Like I say, I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg here. Um, but there are certain components to all of those four roles. Um, just moving on, just what we're looking for. And uh, I know this sounds kind of cheesy, but uh, uh, pardon the terminology, I'm an old guy from Rochester. Um, good humans is key. Okay, we want to develop good humans, then good athletes, than good hockey players. And uh, those are the types that are gonna excel, okay? I, you know, I could expound on that deeper, but it's pretty obvious. Then you got hockey IQ, like I just talked about. Uh, we're looking for players with high compete levels that are, they, you know, as we go up, the competition gets a lot stiffer and we want people that can compete uh, play at speed um, under, you know, all different types of circumstances. So um, the game's involved into puck possession today. Um, it's not chip it out or dump it in. And we hear that at the rinks all the time. And I heard it as a kid. I heard it, believe me, through, uh, through pro hockey. But it's a different game today. Um, we want our kids to be able to possess the puck because it's so hard to get it back. Um, coachability, kids need to be coachable. They need to be able to be approached by the coach and have discussions. And, you know, coaches out there, and I know I'm talking to the parents and the players right now, but um, we need to talk to our kids just like I'm talking to you right now. You know, there's, we don't need to yell at kids. Kids don't react very well to that today. Um, there needs to be a little give and take and you need to tell them why. Um, but also take this a little bit further and I'll use national camps, for example, um, coachability. When you're approached, you need to listen and there has to be interaction. Um, out on the ice, you know, body language is a big deal. Okay, that's, that's a really big deal. We look at that. Uh, you make it past your buddy and he misses it and then you throw your arms up in the air. Um, we're not so sure we want that kid or somebody pointing the finger. So um, that's a big deal. Role acceptance, this comes into play as you get older. Um, not everybody is gonna be the goal scorer, but everybody has to understand that uh, each role on a team, as you get older, uh, is just as important as the other role. And I have numerous stories about uh, Stanley Cup playoffs, et cetera, on guys that just had good hockey sense. They weren't in the top six on the team, but they played a ton because they played their roles very well. Um, Self-starters goes without saying, um, Again, when we turn it over to the kid, 
you know, we always want to guide our children, but um, they need to be self-starters. They can't be told, hey, you need to go in the backyard and shoot 100 pucks. Okay, they need to take control of that and uh, get up and handle it themselves and get creative with their training. Uh, we provide guidance, but that's it. And uh, high skill sets. Are you with me so far? So far with you guys. And we had another question that came okay. through. Let me go back. Go ahead. Uh, it's that studies show skills in isolation do not transfer to games, but if the players do not have the skills to play in games, how do you suggest to balance the two? Ooh, that's very deep. Um, that's a good one. Um, you know, we, we go through a lot of, and I hope this answers the question, but we go a lot through a lot of uh, development seminars and um, you know, coach developer seminars and all this stuff. And uh, that's always been a tough one. But what sticks out to me is individual development, you know, needs to, we need to take a kid, kind of analyze where they're at, and then stretch. You need to pull a stretch. You, you need to challenge them because if it's too easy, then they're not learning and you don't want to overwhelm them. So that's kind of the art of coaching. Um, so on an individual basis, you need to know what that player needs. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I, and I think also that it goes to players, like you said in the beginning at this age, need to take responsibility for their own training and work in the garage, shoot pucks, stick handle on their own, uh, if they get that open ice, go work on edges. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, skills are one thing, um, but I can tell you dealing with, you know, the next step, 15, 16, 17, um, confidence is a huge deal with our kids. And uh, again, if you're a parent and it's your player, you want to instill some confidence in these kids. And there are certain ways to do that. Um, you don't want to bury them, just like we're talking about that instance of having a good mix. Um, so you kind of have to know, and you'll figure it out, what's good for your player, what's challenging for your player and not overwhelming. Yes. Uh, we had another question also come through on this list, and, and I think it's a great question. Is this list in order? And if not, what would you consider the order of the list? Oh boy. No, you know what? Again, I, I just came up with these. Um, we do events, you know, I was talking to Jacob earlier. I've got 200 lanyards from some bigger events that I've done in the last 10 years, but um, no, you know what? This is this is up to you. It's not rocket science. I just came up with these to trigger some some points um, to get you thinking about this kind of stuff. But um, you know, I was I was on the phone with Norm the other day, and and he talked about the two smartest hockey guys um, that he knows, and both of them have won several Stanley Cups. And he's worked with each of them, I believe, for 14 years apiece. Um, not going to name names, but um, hockey IQ is a big deal. Okay. And, you know, we know that we have to have the skill set to get to, you know, high school, college, junior hockey. Um, but hockey IQ is really the difference maker and being a good human is right up there because um, like I say, our, our sport is unique and the people that aren't necessarily doing the right things get weeded out real quick. Yeah. yeah. So and it's interesting on this list, there's, you have a lot of non physical skill traits that are very important. The IQ, the being a good human, having a 
high compete level, coach will accepting your role. I mean, outside of puck possession, these are all human traits and brain and, and cognitive traits. And I think that that's important for parents and players to understand that the type of individual you are will make an impact on teams you make in your future. And um, if hockey is a long-term goal for you. Absolutely. There's no question. Um, you know, this, the skill sets are one thing, the strength, everybody's strong. Um, you know, if, if you want to work hard enough, you can turn yourself into, you know, a big, strong athlete, but these other things are going to help you not only in the game, but in being successful in life. And again, I don't want to sound corny, but I've been around for a long time and I see what happens. Um, and good things happen to good humans. For sure. I mean, there's no guarantee, but I'm telling you, it's, uh, there are some great people on this call tonight that have, that are passionate about the game and it's lifelong sport. So I'm going to play a couple of videos. Is that choppy? I know that our, uh, our videos haven't been playing real nice. Can you see that okay? It's a little, it's a little choppy, but I think okay. we get the point. Well, the, po the point is, is that we're constantly developing. This kid um, at 15, if you can't see the video properly, uh, is real choppy. He's skinny, he's got a toe whip. He's not down on the puck, um, kind of spazzy all over the place. Looks like he'd just gone through or had a growth spurt. And then the kid on the right, oops, which we'll play here. Same kid. I want to say this is only a year later. I, I might be wrong, but 25 pounds heavier refined movements and I know it's choppy guys I apologize for that but that's what we're looking for and and if you're focused you can make those improvements um just where are we at on time here Derek? okay yeah we're doing good I said Derek because I'm looking at his uh, Minnesota hockey thing sorry Jacob so um National Team Development Program. These are essentially their, their uh, formulas. Okay, and these are top 20 kids. Um, I don't wanna go on about this, but these kids are uh, our horses, you know, the top 20 at the U17, U18 team, 135 on ice practices, 115 off ice training sessions. 35 league games for the 17s. Okay. Same, 18U is uh, 25 league games, and then they're, they do a uh, college um, tour. But what I'm saying is the formulas are big. This is a great training formula, and it's all about development because these kids know, the people that are developing them know that. Uh, Physically and mentally, all this stuff doesn't come together until they're 24, 25 years old, okay? The point is, is that game time um, isn't necessarily development time. Um, that's in Swedish, okay. So here, here's uh, one of the best development clubs in the world, Schleftia, Sweden, Northern Sweden. Uh, have some good friends up there, but it shows you that how many ice touches the kids need a week. This is kind of their formula um, and how many off ice training sessions they need a week and who's responsible for it. Can you see that on your screen, Derek, or is it covered up? <clears throat> I'm sorry, Jacob. Nope, I can see it. Okay, so it kind of transfers at uh, 15, 14 years old. Um, but activity time for kids and physical literacy is really a big deal. And uh, with our kids and our culture, 
we're behind on that. And we see it all the time. Um, and our players, their motor skills aren't fully developed. Um, they're deficient in certain areas. And when it comes time to tap into um, or specialize later on, uh, if you, you're not that multi-sport athlete and you don't have those uh, motor skills, it's going to be an issue. So that, that was the point I was trying to make with this slide. Um, here's Finland's deal, ice touches. You know, I can send this out to you guys, cost, cost to play ice hockey. Um, but they're really big on keeping logs and uh, how many activity times you do during the week, how much on ice training, how much off ice training. Um, you know, how you break your week down is very important. You know, like I said earlier, uh, family, friends, school, your sport, uh, you name it. So just to get you thinking about stuff because our culture drives early specialization in sport and it is not good for kids and we know this. Um, just a few things to consider. Again, like I said, Every athlete is an experiment in one. These kids are all the same age. I think this was at a uh, 14 U camp, but um, you know, we had, we had a kid at camp this year he, and he actually made the uh, youth Olympic team by 520 pounds. Also had kids out in the ice at, at uh, 15 that were uh, I think 6'4", 220. So be paid. it's not their fault. Um, you don't have to be a monster to play the game, but uh, compared to the, the popcorn bowl, there's a bunch of kernels in there. Everybody pops at a different time, right? So um, the experts say that this smaller fella potentially could be the top, top player in this group just because he's uh, has to learn that skill at that size for a longer amount of time. Um, but body sizes and shapes, anybody can play the game. Um, everybody has an opinion on it. And uh, the tall kid there probably has a tough time moving his feet right there. So um, be patient. It's not rocket science. Um, if somebody tells you it is, stay away from those people. Uh, keep it simple. Common sense is a good thing. Um, if you need some guidance, uh, talk to your local hockey director, or please feel free. I don't know how many people are on the call tonight, but I love to talk hockey. Um, there are people on this, this call tonight that uh, I talk to weekly. So, um, Hey guy, could you just expand a little bit on every athlete is an experiment in one? Because I think a lot of players and families feel uh, almost an obligation to if their neighbor is doing a program, they should be doing a program. Or if uh, a double A Bantam is doing something, my single A Bantam should be doing the exact same thing. Absolutely. Everybody feels pushed. Everybody's running red line you know, um, wide open all the time. You got to understand your kid, um, what's good for them. And you got to understand that balance thing. Um, and, and then just step back. You don't have to chase your tail. If a kid needs to disengage from the game, awesome. Go play another sport. Still at 14, it's okay. Um, keep them active, healthy. It's good to train, um, but don't don't feel like you have to sign up for everything, because when they burn out or they get overuse injuries, it's really hard to get them back. So that's a family decision. Um, How about now, know? though, guy? I mean, we haven't been on the ice for over a month the rinks aren't open aren't these players losing uh, a lot of time to be working on stuff i mean this is this is a big time for hockey isn't it and 
in the off season or is it better or is it fine that they're not on the ice? It's okay. And in, like I say, if, under the circumstances, you know, it's a brutal situation that we have, but uh, it may be a blessing in disguise for a lot of kids because they've been going too hard for too long. Um, get out and stay active. Obviously practice social distancing and all that stuff, but we're not telling people to not be athletic and not live a healthy lifestyle and be active. We're telling telling people to get away from the rink. And that's a good thing for these kids because again, <laughs> we talked about sleep, nutrition, um, hydration, all this stuff. You need to practice that, but you also need to be active. But it's okay to get away from the rink. It really is. Like you said, play another sport. All the tennis courts are open. Throw the rollerblades on, stick handle, go shoot the basketball, throw the baseball around. Get creative. I got a, I got a great video from uh, – homemade video from Derek Plant the other day. He, Derek played at UMB, works for uh, the Chicago Blackhawks, but it was he, him and his three boys getting creative with stick handling and having fun. Just nice. outside the house, right in the driveway. So um, again, if you're a player or if you're a parent, be patient in players development. Um, that's a big deal. Um, we tend to profile and this is coaches and, and parents and you name it we, we profile kids way too early you never know what you're going to get okay and if you're a hockey player and you're a late bloomer that's okay okay just keep working because if you want it bad enough you're going to get it and you'll figure it out um, parent groups be a positive source of support um that's a big deal. And uh, mom and dad have to understand that, you know, that you want the best for your kid, um, but you really have to be positive when they're coming home and, and they're maybe not feeling like they had a great practice or uh, coach is down on me. You gotta be positive, gotta keep plugging. We need to develop resilient kids so they can, uh, <clears throat> So they'll have successful lifetime skills as well and uh, really excel in the game, but don't do the pile on thing where it might be negative and then a double negative and then things aren't good. So, um, and again, back to the holistic thing, don't chase your tail, understand what's good for you. What's good for your family um, might not necessarily be what's good for another family. So, um, and we have an interesting webinar this Sunday with uh, Heather Mannix, the AD at USA Hockey ADM Regional Manager for Female Hockey. And uh, she's going to be talking about not only coaching psychology, but all studies have shown that the number one reason players, kids play sports is to have fun. And research that she was involved in went into depth and researched what is fun and I think that that would be a great webinar for coaches and parents to listen in on on Sunday evening. That's, that's where it's at. If you're not having fun, why do it, right? And I don't care if it's uh, U6 or uh, professional hockey. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You have to be, you have to have fun and be passionate about the things you're doing. And uh, that's what we're promoting. And, Believe me, don't mistake fun for uh, performance or compete, okay? Because we're all about strong, tough hockey players that have high compete levels, but it's got to be fun or else you're going to be done. So um, I guess I don't know how many more slides I got. We're kind of running out of time here, but just uh, some opportunities for the kids. Um, at 16, uh, we bring in 216 players to national camp throughout the U.S. Everybody has an allotment of players. Uh, that allotment comes through how your players generally grade at camp. They're ev evaluated after all their games um, by guys and gals that do hockey 24-7. Um, 
and it's very in depth. So uh, let's say Minnesota, which uh, grades, you know, at a high rate, B plus A, it's an ABC deal, um, may add another player if they continue to grade high. If they grade lower, then we'll take one away. Um, so that's an opportunity uh, at, at 15 years old for years. The uh, 16s get an opportunity to come to camp, 180 players, um, and they have an opportunity to uh, play on the Five Nations team. And that does not include the national team development players from Plymouth, Michigan. Uh, this is a separate deal. And then uh, for 17 year olds or U18, whoever, uh, 180 players, and uh, you have an opportunity to play on the Holinka team. And that's the most scouted um, tournament prior to draft year. So, uh, he, uh, you know, most of the uh, first rounders from last year's draft played in the Holinka one year earlier. So, and then the girls camps in St. Cloud. Go ahead. And if you're a Minnesota player, what's the process for making it to national camp? Minnesota, you know what? We had that like discussion last night. It, it continues to change, but um, I will say this, that Minnesota's uh, base of the pyramid for this whole process, uh, I think I heard Max say 3,000 players. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so what that's telling me is we're not profiling kids early. Uh, we want more to be involved. We want more kids to develop. Um, I'll, I'll also say that, uh, you know, there was discussion last night about, geez, you know, do you have to make it to this national camp every year? It's all about where you're at in your development. Okay, kids change. Our turnover from 15-year-old to 16-year-old is 50% on average per year. I also know guys that play in the NHL that never made it to national camp. So if you do, awesome. If you don't, keep working because it's not over. Um, you know what, Jacob? I'm, I guess I'll go into this a little bit, but uh, like I say, we're kind of running out of time. Uh, I was fortunate to be a part of the uh, Youth Olympics. So this is kind of the next step um, our guys won a silver medal this year. Russia took gold and Canada took the bronze. But uh, here's our game scores. It's not about X's and O's. I want to make the point here. This, this was our uh, kind of our points that we wanted to make with the kids. And this is, this is how we wanted to play hockey, our style of play. And uh, being a great teammate came first. We had kids from all over the country, okay? And they had to uh, team build and become a team in three days. Then we started performing at this tournament. But our big deal was, it's not tactical. It's all about habits and concepts. It was puck pursuit, back pressure, transition and play fast. Pretty simple stuff. Very little structure play free. That's the way the game is. Um, I think we may have discussed power play breakout. We wanted somebody high. Um, and I think we talked about uh, taking ice away on the penalty kill. And that was it. Okay, as far as structure. So it's not X's and O's. It's not rocket science. It's high skill sets, uh, high hockey IQ, and uh, understanding the habits and the concepts out there. So just a, one of our first training sessions, I mean, this is something, you know, at national camp, we'd probably have 40 kids out on the ice. Uh, we had 17 kids here. They're just playing puck possession right now. Keep away. We want our players to possess the puck. Um, bear with me here. Little angling drill, concepts and habits, compete. Pretty simple stuff. 
And Guy, I think that, you know, when you enter Bantams, the perception is players need to know how to play in a system. You have to know a couple of different breakouts. You need to know a two, one, two, four check, an umbrella power play, uh, uh, a diamond penalty kill. Um, I mean, shouldn't Bantams be learning system play right now? Not necessarily. They should be getting a little, little bit of that stuff. But uh, again, I've, I've been on calls with people from all walks of life and local associations to pro and and uh, they want kids that are prepared physically and mentally, meaning the hockey IQ thing, and that's not X's and O's, it's concepts and reading numbers and taking ice. Um, so no, because they, they, they'll teach them the system when they get there, and it'll probably take about five minutes. Um, so if you understand the concepts, you have the hockey IQ, and we're watching the drills that you're doing here and what you've done, and it seems like that simply by working on these concepts like angling and back pressure uh, and transition play, um, that that's really hockey. It doesn't matter if your coach tells you to stand here and move here, because it's played in this ten. It's played in this ten by ten area, anyways. Absolutely. You need to react, spatial awareness, understanding the numbers. When can I get engaged? When can I disengage? Um, puck support. You know, I could go through all, all the stuff, but, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people that can speak the language and, and use big words, but that's that's really not it. It's about uh, preparing our kids for the next level. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll harp on that hockey IQ, physical literacy, skill sets. That's a big deal. So I just wanted to get people thinking that way, that this is what we did in practice. And it was important to us on angles in, in doing, um, you know, back pressure. So here's a Recap of a game with Finland. Playing fast. Staying above the puck. Transition. We had back pressure, we had good support there. And boom, we turn it over and here we go. Good back pressure on the inside here, and then boom, right out of the zone, transition, here we go. And this is the kind of stuff we showed our our kids um, the next day, and it, this is it. Like, we didn't sit there and do a bunch of video stuff. This is it. Those were poor angles. We didn't take ice. We didn't steer properly, and uh, the finished player carried it all the way up the ice. Locking shots was a big deal. some back pressure, good hustle, and ends up in their net. But these kids are all making decisions really quick, and they're, they're working on transition. This is a great goal right here, playing free. All coaching. Oh, no. I just said exchange. <laughs> really, really good kids. We have five Minnesota kids on this team. So um, very fortunate to be involved with this. It was a great experience. Um, really fun hockey to be a part of. So I'm going to move through these here. We got can uh, we had Canada and we had Switzerland. Russia beat us in the championship game. Um, we still play the same style. They had some kids that uh, were really, really good hockey players. And, and we took our best 17 at this point in time um, because you know that there are other kids that are going to catch up and surpass some of these kids too. So, um, but it was a great experience and uh, proud to be a part of it. So 
with that said, um, again, we, I didn't want to get too in depth here, but uh, um, please feel free to contact me um, if you want to talk hockey. I'm proud to be from Minnesota. I grew up in Minnesota. I have uh, the pride and, and uh, had a great experience with Minnesota hockey and, and have for 50 plus years. So thanks for having me, Jacob. Well, thanks, Guy. We did have one question that came through, and, and I think it's a great question. Um, it seems like a consistent theme for the leading countries producing high-end hockey players is they have all shifted their focus to individual skills development. What would your ideal week consist of if you were the coach of a Bantam team with three to four practices a week? Um, that's a direct question, right? I, you know, like, yes. Um, it depends where the kids are at. It really depends where they're at. De depends on the training schedule. Um, okay, we know that Europeans are focused on skill sets. That's a big deal. But how they do it is even a bigger deal. Um, so this is a, I don't want to take too much time here, but so skill sets and when you work on them, they, they have to have complete focus and uh, we call it deep training. And the way you do it is you have to really be thinking about it and you have to refine those motions. Um, you can't just go through the motions. So it depends on the players that you're having. Um, you as a coach have to put it onto yourself and say, okay, are they really into this? Or are they just going through the motions? That's a key factor in this. I know guys that, that will take a certain amount of practice and work on it. And, uh, you know, when I'm out there and I want to make a difference in, in a kid's skill set, I'm going to ask them, you know, do you like music? Yeah. Well, do you have rhythm? Right. So that's a, that's a big deal. Like having all these movements flow together is a big deal. And there's certain ways to do that. So, um, I can talk offline with that person if they'd like to, give me a call because I think that that it really matters um, who you're dealing with, um, what the drills are and uh, kind of what your, your training sessions and in, in your uh, scheduling looks like. For Hopefully sure. That answer, you know, it's kind of a roundabout thing, but it, it's like I say, it's not an exact and I can give you this PowerPoint if you contact me and and uh, you can look further at the uh, the European model and their ratios as well. Beautiful. Well, Guy, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, stay safe, everybody. Um, like I say, please reach out anytime. Love to talk hockey. And uh, nice to see all my friends that were on the call, too. So thanks for the support. Great job, Jacob. Thank you. And for those of you uh, who have questions after the fact, uh, please reach out to uh, your district hockey director. You can find their information under about board of directors, the committees, and then your hockey director committee. They are all well trained and versed in ADM and Minnesota development model. And you can obviously reach out to Guy or myself so thank you all for joining us, Guy. A big thank you. Have a good rest of the night uh, and stay safe, everybody. Thanks, everybody.